Hello, and welcome back to our reading of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Um, it's absolutely lashing outside with rain at the moment here, you know, pounding against the window in the kitchen. So I thought now would be a good opportunity to finish off our story. Um, I realise we've not got far until Christmas now, so uh, it has to be re finished relatively swiftly for you to be able to get a benefit of it at this time of year. With that in mind, let's begin chapter four, The Last of the Spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near to him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to gather in gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing visible save for one outstretched hand. But for this it would have been difficult to detach the figure from the night and the darkness which it was surrounded by. He felt it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed outward with its hand. You are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, whilst he, though he stretched out to his utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Ghost of future, he exclaimed, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen, but as I know your purpose is to do me good, and I hope to live to be another man from what I was. I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart, but will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, said Scrooge. Lead on, the night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. I know, spirit. Spirit, lead on. The phantom moved away as it had come to towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But they were, in the heart of it, on change, amongst the merchants who hurried up and down and clinked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and looked at their watches and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them often. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed toward them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another one. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? asked a third, taking a vast quantity of stuff out of a very large snuff box. I thought he'd never die. Who knows, said the first with a yawn. I wonder what he's done with his money, asked a red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excreance to the end of his nose, which shook like the gills of a turkey cock. I haven't heard, said the man with a lot with the large chin, yawning again. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all that I know. This pleasantry was received with a general laugh. It'll likely be a very cheap funeral, said the same speaker, for upon my life I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. 
I don't mind going if the lunch is provided, observed the gentleman with the excrements on his nose, but I must be fed if I make one. Another laugh. Well, I am the most disinterested amongst you of all, said the first speaker, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most peculiar friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. The speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on into the street. Its finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that an explanation might lie here. He knew these men also perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy and of great importance. He'd always made a point of standing well in their esteem, in a business point of view, that is, strictly in a business point of view. How are you? said one. How are you? returned the other. Well, said the first, old Scratch got his own at last, I see. So I'm told, returned the second. Cold, isn't it? Sensible for Christmas time, but you're not a skater, I suppose. No, no, something to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, their parting. Scrooge at first was inclined to be surprised that the spirit would attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. But, feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply the term. But nothing doubting that to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for his improvement. He resolved to treasure up every word he heard, and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed, and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He looked about at the very place of his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to its usual time of day for him being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured through the porch. It gave him a little surprise, however, to find that he'd been resolving in his mind to change a life, and thought and hoped that he saw his new warm resolutions had carried out in this. Quiet and dark behind him stood the phantom, with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from the thoughtful quest, He fancied from the turn of the hand and the situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although it recognised its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow and the shops and houses were wretched, the people half naked, drunken, slipshod and ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorged their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Far in the den of this infamous resort, there was a low-browed, beetling shop below a penthouse roof, where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within there were piled heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinise were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat, and sepulchres of bones. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a grey-haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age, who'd screened himself from the cold air without by a frowsy curtain of miscellaneous tatters hung upon a line, and smoked his pipe with all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. She'd scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon recognition of each other. 
After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone be the first, cried she who entered first. Let the laundress alone be the second. Let the undertaker's man come to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. <sighs> you couldn't have met in a better place, said old Joe, removing the pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlour. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and all the other two aren't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, how it shrieks. There ain't a rusty bit of metal in this place on its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure that there's no old such old bones in here as mine. <laughs> We're all suitable to our calling. We're all well matched. Come into the parlour. Come, come into the parlour. The parlour was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. Whilst he did this, the woman who'd already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees, and looking with bold defiance at the other two. "'What's odds, then? What's odds, Mrs Dibbler?' said the woman. "'Every person has the right to take care of themselves. He always did.' That's true indeed, said the laundress. No more so. Why then, don't stand about staring as if he was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs Dibbler and the man together. We would hope not. Very well then, cried the woman. That's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs Dilber, laughing. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, pursued the woman, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had someone to look after him when his death struck instead of lying, gasping out his last there, alone, by himself. There's the truest word that was ever spoken, said Mrs Dibbler. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, replied the woman. And it should have been, you may depend on it, for if I could have laid my hands on anything else... Open that bundle, old Joe. Let me know the value of it. Speak plain. I'm not afraid to be first, nor afraid to see, for them to see it. We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friend would not allow this, and the man, faded in black, mounting the breech forest, produced his plunder. It was not extensive, a seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value were all. They were severely examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums up as he was disposed to give each upon the wall, and added them up and totaled what he'd found when there was nothing more to come. <laughs> That's your account, said Joe, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was be to be boiled or not for doing it. Who's next? Mrs Dibbler was next, sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine. That's why I'll ruin myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. Joe bent down on his knees for the greater convenience of openings and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large, heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? said Joe. Bed curtains? Ah, said the woman returning, and laughing, and leaning forward with her crossed arms. <laughs> Bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took him down rings and all with him lying there? said Joe. Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, said Joe, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold out my hand when I can get anything by reaching out for it for the sake of the man he was here, I promise you, Joe. I certainly shan't hold out my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out for the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coldly. Don't drop oil on the blankets now. His blankets, said Joe. Who else do you think, replied the woman. It's not like he was taken cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh, said Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. And I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him if he did have such things. 
Ah, you may have a look at that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and fine one too. It'd be wasted if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? asked old Joe. Putting him in it to be buried, to be sure, replied the woman, laughing. <laughs> Somebody was fool enough to do it, and I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it ain't good enough for anything. It's quite becoming to the body, and he can't look any uglier in it than he did with that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror as they groped about their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp. He viewed them with detestation and disgust which could have hardly been greater, though they'd been obscene demons and marking the corpse itself. Ha! <laughs> laughed the old woman, with old Joe producing a flannel bag with money in it, and told out their several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. <laughs> he frightened away every one from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. Ha ha ha! Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heavens, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in an awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to the secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest rising of it, the motion of the finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to do so, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than dismiss the spectre at his side. Oh, cold! cold, rigid, dreadful death, set up thine altar there, and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. But of the loved, revered, and honoured head, thou canst not turn one hair upon thy dread purpose, or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy, and will fall down when raised. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous and true. The heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse of a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds spring from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would his foremost thought be? Avarice? Hard dealing? Griping cares? They've brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in a dark, empty house, with not a man, a woman, or a child to say he was kind to me in this or that, or for the memory of one kind word I would like to be kind to him. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not care to think. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lessons. Trust me, let us go. Still, the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. Yes, I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonised. Show me that person's spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight, where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, and looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, and tried, but in vain, to work with her needle 
but could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband as the man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression on it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed, which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what the news, which was not until after a long silence, that he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good, she said, or bad to help him? Bad, he answered. We are quite ruined. No, no, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He's past relenting, said her husband. He's dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face spoke the truth but she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness with the next moment, and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. What the half-drunken woman, whom I told you last night, said to me, when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, was that I thought it was a mere excuse to avoid me. It turns out to be quite true. He'd not only been very ill, but was dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before time we shall be ready with the money, and even though we're not, it will be a bad fortune indeed to find some merciless creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight with light heart, Caroline. Yes, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood, were brighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with that death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we've left just now will be with forever me. The ghost conducted him through several streets, familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he'd visited before, and found the mother and children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and daughter were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set it before him in their midst. Where had Scrooge heard those words? Had he not dreamed them? The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand upon her face. The the colour hurts my eyes, she said. The colour? Ah, poor tiny Tim. They're they're better again now, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show you my weak eyes to your father when he comes for the world. It, It must be near his time. Past it rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I I think he walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mother. They were quiet again. At last she said in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I've known him walk with... I've known him walk with tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. So have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, claimed another, and so said all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work. And father loved him so, and it was no trouble, no trouble. And and there is your father at the door. She hurried to meet him, and little Bob, in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. When the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they would say, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs Cratchit and the girls. They will be long done before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You you went today then, Robert? said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It it would have done you good to see how green the place is, but you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk on a little Sunday. 
My little, little child, cried Bob. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his children would have been further apart perhaps than they were. He left the room and went upstairs to the room above, which was lighted carefully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child. There were signs of one having sat there recently. Poor Bob sat down on it, and when he thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened, went down again, quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and whom on meeting him in the street that day, and seeing that he looked just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what happened to distress him. On which, said Bob, for he was the most pleasant spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I'm heartily sorry for you, Mr Cratchit, he said, and I'm heartily sorry for your good wife. By the way, how do you think he knew? I don't know. Knew what, my dear? That you were a good wife, replied Bob. Everybody knows that, said Peter. Well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, said he, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now it wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything that he might be able to do for us, so much for all for his kind way. It was just quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known Tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Mrs Cratchit. You would be sure of it, my dear, returned Bob, if you saw and, and spoke to him. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say, if you got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter? And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you, retorted Peter, grinning. Uh, it's just as likely as not, said Bob. One of these days, there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from company from one another, I'm sure none of us will forget poor Tiny Tim, shall we? Our first parting that there ever was amongst us. Never, father, they all cried. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little child, we shall not quarrel easily amongst ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried again. I am very happy, said little Bob. I am very happy. Mrs Cratchit kissed him, and his daughters kissed him, and the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was a gift from God. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what this man was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come surveyed him, as before, though at different times. He thought, indeed, there seemed no order to these latter visions, save that they were in the future into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the end just now desired, until be sought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now, is my place of occupation, is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped, and the hand was pointed elsewhere, the house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point that way? The inexorable figure underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom still pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate, and he paused to look around before entering. A churchyard? Here then the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay beneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, and growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with appetite, 
a worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded what he saw a new meaning to its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to the stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses they departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immobile as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I the man that lay upon the bed? He cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. Oh no, spirit, oh no, no. The finger was still there. Spirit, he cried tightly, clutching at his robe. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been for this intercourse. Show me, why show me this if I'm past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me, assure me that I may yet change these shadows you've shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all of the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I shall not shut out lessons they have taught. Oh, tell me, may I sponge away the writing on this stone? In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed and dwindled down into a bedpost. End of stave four.